this bit on structuralism. All right, so let's start with any questions. I assigned one absolutely essential essay, which you cannot take a methods and theory class without confronting, and that is the text by Ferdinand de Saussure. That's the text on uh, what we call semiotics or sign and signifier. That's a basic, important structuralist text. You cannot go. And then I had a problem because I could have assigned any of these others. And I actually tried to not assign too long of ones with this one because I wanted you to get this one. Um, so uh, I think we will do Death of the Author by Bart later, so we'll be able to talk about um, that a bit more. So the other one I assigned is by Jakobsen. Um, and Jakobsen is a very important linguist, very important theorist of language, um, one of the uh, Russian formalists. So, so any, um, so any, any, any questions before we begin? Anything that was like, I don't understand this at all. What are they talking about? Or is it all too? Is it too much of a blur to even articulate? Be honest with me. Yeah, yeah, Katie. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Let's. Um, so, so let me just say a few words, and and um, and you can write these down. Oh, so first of all, it's funny the way the book, this book, kind of articulates it. This was, I think, very helpful. I would refer back to the reading on structuralism here if you're confused. This one, I think, really lays it out and helps you to then understand this here. I think he does a good job. The one thing I take issue with is he sort of says like, well, structuralism came after new criticism. What he means is that it became influential in English language uh, in the 1960s. That's when we started um, reading other people. So, and this is from your books, so you absolutely don't need to write that down, but it precedes new criticism, but not in English. These things were translated and then made a bigger impact here, but they're actually from the 1920s, not the, not the not, um, yeah, the 1920s and the 1910s. So they've actually been around for a while. Um, so, so and, and it's interesting that they came into the academy in, in, um, in Europe, uh, in, in Western Europe, and in the Anglophone world, uh, the UK and, and the US and all of the colonies, all of the English-speaking world, in the 1960s, and I think that's important. They were kind of radical ideas. So um, so they get a lot. What, what happens is you get the influence of, of linguistics and I would say philosophy. The, the, the book doesn't talk very much about philosophy, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of that here. OK, so let's talk about Lang and Parole, because that's the very first thing that you get in your book. So if you want to look at where this gets articulated, um, actually, it's in, it's in uh, Dale Parker's book. Um, it's right on page 45. The, 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 this little um, graph is on page 53, but it's on page 45 of, um, of this text. All right. So what he says is that instead of describing particular language or particular uses of language like previous linguistics, Saussure decided to describe the overall system of language. He drew a binary opposition. Binary just means between two. A binary opposition between lang, French for language, and parole, French for speech. And then he refers us to this table. So um, as we will see, for the structuralists, it's not just that, um, that language, language and parole or, or um, have this relationship where they're this way. It's almost that for, for the structuralists, Um, 
language has this relation and parole or speech act has this relation. <laughs> You're going, what is he talking? That doesn't make any sense to me. So what I mean is that um, that this is an entire system of language. This includes all of the rules for grammar and syntax. Also, um, it contains all of the vocabulary, etc. Right? So the reason I put it in, and the and the structuralists put it in this relation is it means anytime you speak, you're choosing from a whole system of possibilities. That's why I put it in this way, because um, uh, I'm choosing I'm choosing without without thinking about it consciously, I'm choosing a, between a whole system of different possibilities of what to say. The reason the, uh, the, the speech act happens in this direction is that it is more governed by the word that came before and the word that comes after. Also temporally, what came before and what came after, like chronologically or in time. Does that make sense? So if, uh, if I come into the classroom and I say, um, um, well, that was a nice class. Have a nice couple days, everybody. At the beginning of class, it's gonna like you're gonna go wait what? Because you were expecting me to pick from this system of languages some kind of utterance or 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 articulation that is based on this, which is the beginning of class, not the end of class. Your expectations are based on that, and I choose on the basis of of um, not a rules for grammar and syntax, but things like, what do they say here? Um, uh, individual sentence, text, uh, no, no, no. I, this is say instance. Uh, instance has, what I like about this is this has this kind of like, um, uh, it has this kind of time element built into it where there's something almost feeling eternal about this. Now we know it's not eternal, right? Because the rules for all these things shift. So like, by the way, whenever I write a text or whenever I'm editing a text, I do not use gendered pronouns any longer. That was considered ungrammatical when I was an undergrad. You could not do it. Do you know what I mean? Um, if I were to say, um, if I were to say, uh, uh, when a student when a student walks in the classroom, I would have to say he or she should find a proper seat. Now it's perfectly acceptable to say when I walk when a student comes into the classroom, they can find their seat. Even though there's a there's a there's a problem of agreement between an individual uh, singular pronoun in the first part, student, or a singular noun and then the pronoun, which is supposed to agree with it in number, it no longer does, they, but it does now because we've changed our understanding of pronouns, right? Because we understand that he, she doesn't cover the whole gambit and some people don't even identify with either he or she, right? So then we change the language. That means that this eternal thing has changed. But for the most part, we have agreement about this. So questions about this because it's kind of complicated. Do you have another example? Another example of, of well, what you just did, what you just did was 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 a speech act. So your speech act was um, was based was basically an act of uh, of the instance of parole of 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 a speech act. When you did, when you chose those words, you were choosing from a whole list of words you could have said, right? You, and and what, that, what you're doing is you're putting together Langdon Parole without ever thinking about it, without ever cognizing it. 
You're making these choices, yeah. So it's kind of like using your list of words in your head in a specific order to convey your message. Right, right, the list of words in your head, um, a specific order, all kinds of other things that they don't talk about here would would fit into the L system, like um, protocols. Like, so if you said to me, uh, you know, uh, Ruderman, what the fuck are you talking about? That would not be appropriate for the classroom, right? So you made a choice not to say that. You said, can you give me another example? <laughs> Even though they're, they might have similar, right, you know, uh, meanings, you didn't choose, you chose from the, the L system, the one that had the appropriate, which means that it also governs not just rules, uh, grammar, syntax, vocabulary, but also speech situations, appropriate protocols for certain situations, right? So yeah, that's exactly so, right. So then, as opposed to the parole, which would be like what essentially, like so, what I'm, well, I just said. Yes. The, can you give me another example? Is classified under language, but like, and and what? How would I contrast what I'm saying now? Everything you say now is parole. Everything oh. you say now is speech. Everything you actually say, everything you actually write, is speech. But what you don't see happening, governing the whole thing, is this other system. So they, they're one and the same. Yeah, where you where what you just said? Well, they're not one and the same. They are very they are they are, there's a binary opposition, but this is where you just spoke to me from. Do you guys get that? He just spoke to me from the place of Lang and Pearl where they meet. And that's where I've been. It's the only place where you can speak. It's the only place you can articulate anything. It's from that place where you where you're choosing uh uh, a certain, from a system of languages, you're choosing certain words to say, in certain certain order, certain uh, uh, ways of saying it. We could go on and on with this. There's even tonality, there's body gesture. All of these can be uh, part of the instance, but they come out of this uh, this 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 choice, right? If you've ever known anybody that has kind of limited in this area for different reasons, or has a weird kind of mix-up in this, so, so, you know, one thing that will do it, if you, uh, an English is a second language person, they say the most interesting things. I wrote a poem once based on something that somebody who is not an English speaker had said. Um, she said, um, can you explain me the sublime and the shit? She didn't mean that. She mean, can you explain me, can you explain to me what you meant when you talked about the sublime as being like a ship. But because she had this whatever, her parole came out different. And it was very interesting because she's working in a second or third language and she's talking to Emma. So it's like, I might be wrong, but yeah. like, like the lines, like in the middle, that line can like slide up and down depending on like what your ability in the language or parole is like either way. Mm, that I would not say that. I would not say that. I would say that the line stays the same. Um, it's just that you have, um, there may be, it's possible that there's less here for you if you're like five or six, or then if you're 25 or 26. You're going to have a bigger uh, set of rules, a bigger vocabulary. Uh, you'll understand the rules of grammar and syntax. You'll understand situations. That's why kids will walk up and say, um, why do you have those spots on your face? You know, because they don't, they haven't learned yet. You're not supposed to walk up to a stranger and say, you know, why do you have pimples or whatever? You know, they just don't, they don't know it yet, you know. So, um, so, so they haven't learned it so that you'll have a bigger choice as you get, as you grow. But I would say that, what, that, that we move on this line, that the line sort of stays constant. It's, it's not, re it's just an abstract way to articulate it. And that's, you're going to have to face this a lot in, in structuralism. Abstract ideas that come in to kind of stand for something else. Now, I have, I have put these axes up here because I'm trying to anticipate Jakobsen. So Saussure does not necessarily draw these axes out, but structuralists do. Structuralists also use all kinds of other uh, things that you don't need to learn in this class. Like they have a square where they put antinomies on different points and they talk about how to relate to them, but yeah, we're not going to do that. Yeah, awesome. So parole is like what's appropriate for a moment and language is what's the thing you choose from to address that? 
That's interesting. Parole is whatever you say. It can be appropriate or inappropriate. You can, because some people choose to say inappropriate things all the time, or if they're nervous, like me, they say inappropriate things when they're nervous. The language is just like a list. A language is just a list, uh huh. Okay. It's a, yeah. So language, language is just like a system of rules or protocols, and I uh, and it governs uh, speech. Um, this L system governs everything that gets said. This is the individual statement. So if there's like a car, like it'd be like the parts to a car for language. Sure, but sure. You could put it together in all different kinds of oh, ways, okay. right? Um, it may not fit together as okay. well, right? Or it might not yeah. run, but you could put it together in all different kinds okay. of ways. Sure, that works for me too. Like they're parts that you that you could choose from, and you do it unconsciously. You do it unconsciously. You do it like this. Um, let me go back here. Um, so there are a number of different ways to understand this, which he goes, wh which Dale Parker goes through um, here. Um, he says that 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 the Lang is a system. And the parole or speech is just an instance um, when you have uh, when you are well versed in language, you might say, boy, that person has a good vocabulary, right? But the actual performance of it is what you're judging it on. Um, grammar for language, individual sentence for parole or speech. Um, I don't understand what he means there. Deep structure versus surface structure, I do understand, right? Like, um, mm, what exists, what exists in it, uh, what exists when you're um, analyzing, for example, a sentence. Uh, um, uh, when you're at the level of the speech, you're, an, you're anal and just like what was said and how it was said, you're analyzing the surface structure. But when you start to talk about why did the poet choose that word? you suddenly find yourself back in the system of language, and then you're dealing with the deep structure. Um, I, I think this will become clear, I hope. Um, and then these things don't worry too much. These are, one way to think about it, you guys, you know the way that people use the word like meta language or meta something. For any particular, uh, uh, <coughs> sentence or phrase or stanza in a poem, whatever you're interpreting, um, uh, this is more of the meta-analysis, and this is more of the uh, individual close reading analysis. Does that make sense? You're more on the level of the, the, the granular here, and then you're more at the larger level of structure here. Yes? Um, the interpretation of individual text, is that like looking at the actual words? Yes, exactly, exactly. So when you're and when you're when you're over here in the system of language and thinking about the system of language, you're thinking more about like so. Let's say we're individual. We're we're and they and and the thing about this is that remember the point where you're at. That's the crossbar. You're always there. You can't get away from it. Um, I understand this. There's another way to understand this, which we'll talk about later, which has to do um, with more of an individual's. Um, uh, psychology or something like that. Any given moment, you could um, you could be in a memory, uh, and in that memory you would be on this line. But when you're in the present, you're kind of here. But you always you're always at the crossbar between what has happened to you and where you are. You're, you cannot get away from the moment. When we meditate here, the, the goal is for us to be more in class, more in the moment, and that is to be more at that axis. So when we're interpreting the individual text, let's say we're interpreting a sonnet. And um, uh, or, or we're interpreting a poem, and uh, and um, I say, uh, you say, I think it's really interesting that the rhyme, the rhymes are so hectic right here. And I go, oh yes, but in fact, I think that they're borrowing from the um, Pindaric ode form some rhyme schemes and then importing them into the sonnet. You see, what I've just done is left over to here. By talking about a whole theory of text and textuality, I've left over to here. So we're always doing both. There's no way that you're not doing both. Whenever you just blurt something out, you're still in language. You're still in that deep structure. I think it's really beautiful. I think it's a beautiful way of talking about um, 
the way that we are in the world linguistically. We are in the world linguistically um, in, in something that is always very deep and also very shallow, very dissurfacy. Right? Because we're always at the, the intersection of Lang and Pearl. Every, every sentence in here, every sentence in here, every sentence anywhere, it, this, these sentences, they're all at the point, uh, they're all at that crux. There's no place for them to be except at that crux. Our job as literary critics might be to think about the ways in which it brings together um, these things and these things. And we might say, I'm going to think about it in relation to these things. That's just a different part of the axis. You're just saying, OK, later you're going to, um, Jakobsen is going to say, this is, the, uh, this is the, um, the axis of contiguity or, or temporality, and this is the axis of combina or no, this is the axis of combination, and this is the axis of, ch of ch choosing, or something like that. I can't remember exactly what his language is, um, but those are the those are the two. Okay. Any questions about that? Turn to your book on page 28 um, when he talks about sign signifier. Wait, which book? I'm sorry, uh, uh, the big book. If you don't have it with you, then share it with somebody else. Okay. Um, the, the, the good thing about this book, or getting a book like this, is it has the whole essay. Parker, Parker just cut parts, cut parts out, which I understand. He can't put the whole essay in there, or, or else book, this big book would be even bigger, right? Um, on page uh, 38 and 39. I have my contacts in, so if I say, if I say the wrong thing, it's just, yeah, I'm sorry. I got so tired of wearing my heavy glasses. Um, all right, so uh, so this is from the course in general uh, linguistics. So this is a, a, what we're dealing with here is a Swiss linguist who was very influential, uh, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, very influential, and gave these lectures called the Course in General Linguistics, where he re he used a guy, an American guy, named, um, it's pronounced Peirce, but it actually looks like Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E, -E, like Pierce, but it's pronounced Peirce. Um, uh, this guy, Peirce, was the first person to really do this kind of structuralism we're talking about. That's why, um, in this book, the essays by Peirce are the very first ones, right? Um, and so, 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 so Sewer is lecturing, and he never writes a book. Instead, his students come along and copy out all of their notes, and they get together, and they compile them into a book. So once he's dead, I guess, I don't really remember, but it's like they get published posthumously, something like that, I think, like after he died, and, um, and that's what we're dealing with. But we have to thank him so much because I think this is really beautiful and really helpful. So Saussure um, wants to talk about this thing. Now, does anybody know what this is called? This is called a sign. Semiotics. The um, theory of signs. So with this particular um, structural um, concept, you could understand, interpret any sign system. So um, what's a sign system? What's a sign, I mean, not a system. What's a sign? What do you mean to say? Something that stands for something else, right? So, um, so a painting can be a sign. 
An advertisement is a sign, like a billboard. Especially if there's no words, it's interesting to see just these billboards that have no words. They're just like a, a Nike swoosh. The first time I saw that, I was like, what? You, know, you guys are too, too young, but I mean, I was like, what? <laughs> it's like just the swoosh, right? It just stood for something, right? Um, uh, language is definitely a sign. Body language is a sign. Um, you can get into a semiotics of, of um, clothing, a semiotics of how you dress, or a semiotics of semiotics of, of, of music, things like this. So there are all different ways to interpret this sign. And it has three parts to it. It has the signified, it has the signifier, and it has this thing, the referent. Now, the, the the bit that he chose for us here, um, uh, so I'm at page 39. Let me, let me go ahead and read this from the top of page 39. The linguistic sign, then, is a two-sided psychological entity that can be represented, represented by the drawing. Concept at the top, sound image at the bottom. The two elements are immediately united and each recalls each other. Whether we try to find the meaning of uh, uh, the Latin word arbor or the word that Latin uses to designate the concept tree, it is clear that the only associations sanctioned by that language appeal to us to conform to reality. It is clear that only the associations, uh, yeah, right, right. Uh, only associations sanctioned by that language appeal to us um, to conform to reality, and we disregard what others might be imagined. So, do you see what he's saying? If I say to you, um, uh, I sat under a tree and composed that poem, you immediately cycle through all the other meanings of tree, and you know the one that I mean is the one that, that looks like this, and it comes out of the earth, and you can sit under it, get shade from. Not the family tree, not the um, uh, what are the, uh, not a shoe tree, not these other uses of tree, right? Just that use of tree. Okay, you automatically know it. How do you know it? You know it by its relation to other things that it is um, it is connected to in the sentence. So what that means is that um, hold on. Let me try to do it over here so it's all on one page. Um, meaning uh, depends on relation. It's a word, word, word. You can't understand word two if I separate word one and word two. So if I say to you, um, get, get the rake, a three word sentence. If I just say to you, rake, you won't know what I mean. If I just say to you, get, you won't know what I mean. If I just say to you, the, you won't know what I mean. So meaning depends on a relation between different signifiers. Is that clear? I know this might even seem too easy or too, too simplified. Yes? So the word that, like, rake in that instance would be the signified, and the other words, like, in the context? No, they're all signs. Okay. Each one is a sign. Okay, okay, okay. And, um, and, but you won't know at the beginning of the sentence what get uh, um, means until you get to the end of the sentence, right? Now some have less play in them, some have a lot of play in them, right? Some words have a lot of play in them. Uh, I don't know. Um, it seems to me like certain words uh, like um, sulfur ha doesn't have much play in it, but a word like dream has a lot of play. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean all kinds of things, right? Yes? So like the individual word could be a role, and then like the whole sentence together could be like language? 
That's what that's what he was getting. He was saying that when you think on the level of the word, you're more in the parole system, and when you think on the level of the whole sentence, or even the larger than the sentence, like the whole uh, the whole poem or the whole uh, letter that you got from uh, uh, a lawyer, it could be on the level of length. Okay, so meaning and. Meaning is always in relation, word to word to word. Um, let me say a word about this, which does not even appear in this version, but does appear in this version. So when I say to you the word cat, C-A-T, and that's, the, that's something that uh, Sister Ward uses, cat. He says, why is it called cat? And not, what is it? Is it gato in... Spanish, gato. Um, does anybody know other languages? Uh, the word cat. French is shot, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, so, so you see what I'm saying? So what happens is that the nature of language itself. So first, meaning depends on relation. Secondly, um, it's ambiguous. No. I'm not going to use that word. I'm sorry. Erase that. Um, it is arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. Now, there are onomatopoeic words, like splash. Sounds like the thing that it is. Bark. Sounds like kind of like when my dog barks. It's, it's kind of silly. He actually sounds like he's saying, bark, bark. Um, uh, so those are onomatopoeic words, but they are not, for the most part, the major words we use in any language. Most of the choices we have are arbitrary. There's nothing cat-like about the word cat. There's nothing tree-like about the word tree. There's no reason it should be tree and not arbor. There's no reason, except that it's a different language. So. Um, it depends on relation. It's arbitrary. Um, these are the two things that destabilize language as a sign system. The fact that it depends on relation and contiguity. Boo, 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 boo. It has to be in order, and you have to understand it. And second, the cho very choice of the word is arbitrary. Stabilizes or destabilizes? What? Stabilizes or destabilizes? Both. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it destabilizes it mostly, I would say, because it, um, if I say to you, um, uh, uh, um, that's a really cool cat, I could be talking about a jazz musician, I could be talking about a tractor, or I could be talking about a little furry thing. You see what I mean? All, th all three work in that same sentence. So that's kind of destabilizing. So it would have to be, the, you would need the context of where I was standing. I'm standing in a field. I point towards a large machine and I say, that's a little cat. Then you know I'm talking about a tractor. So then the signifier, the signifier, are you going to get to that? or like? Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, so, um, so the signified is the actual um, word. So the signified is the actual word. Um, the signifier is the sound image. But the actual thing itself that you're trying to get to, the referent, it never enters into language. This is very, very upsetting for people like me and for philosophers, etc. Because what that means is language can't actually get at actual objects. So if I want to talk about um, the chair that my father sat in the last 20 years of his life, the, the, the kind of worn out Barca lounge or whatever it was, you know, where the feet come up and the back goes back and, you know, I can't really get to that chair in language. I can just say the word chair and then I could use lots of other things, but the referent is never actually part of the speech situation. We're alienated from it. We cannot touch it. It is apart from us. 
And that's a little, un, for somebody like me, like, in a certain way, poetic language, I think, sometimes comes closer to getting at the referent, but only because poetic language can sometimes use tricks to, to actually, I would say it uses tricks to, um, to take that destabilization you were talking about and turn it into a positive rather than a negative situation. And in that kind of like destabilization, maybe the referent is kind of a ghost there in that language, right? Like when I was describing my father's chair, if I began to talk about the way that all of the actual fabric had become shiny, do you know what I mean? From him sitting on it so many times, and I could, I could sort, of, I could sort of say, um, the chair worn shiny by years of unhappiness. It actually, I'm using, I'm using the all of the destabilization there to try to get you closer to the referent, but I never can get to the referent. This is, I mean, this is like a problem, just a basic problem. So any questions about this part of what I just said? So he goes on to talk about the arbitrary nature of the sign. Um, he talks about the linear nature of this uh, of the signifier. What that means is that what you have is a chain of signifiers As, um, in language. Uh, you can see it here on pages 42 and 43. He gives you the way that there's a chain of signifiers. I mean, the thing about language is that it's so beautiful and it's so flawed. I mean, it's absolutely flawed. You will have, just try to explain to somebody something. And you, and you constantly come back, it's so flawed, it's a flawed system. Um, but it's also, I think, quite beautiful. The other thing I want to talk about is um, the arrows moving in both directions. Do you see this? The arrow moving in this direction and the arrow moving in this direction. So what that means is that, um, that like when, you're, when you have a child that you're trying to teach language to, you will point to the chair and you will say, chair. What you're doing in that in, uh, instance is you're starting with this, the sound image and then work, working backward to the word. So it works in both directions. It works in both directions. How is it coming back to the signifier? Um, because for the child, the child sees the object chair, the reference, and then you're, you're, say, you're introducing the child to the sign. The child already knows the reference. But you're uh, introducing the child to a sign, and you're saying chair, chair. All of those, the k -k sound, all of that is um, is in in the signified. But you're 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 introducing by the sound image. You're getting back up to that, especially when you teach the child when the child's maybe two years older, and you go C H A I R. Then the child is now completely moved up into the signifier. So you've gone the opposite direction to get to the signifier. Right? Once you've learned it, and, and sometimes we still do that. We st sometimes still, like when you're having a dream and you're like, I don't know what that was, I don't know. It was, oh, I know. It was, uh, it was one of those radiators that they have in those old houses, you know? That's what it was in my dream, it was a radiator. So you're moving from the image up into language, up into the signifier. So you're working in a dream-like way to get back to the signifier. Should we wake up Luke or just let him sleep? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is difficult stuff. I get it. <laughs> Makes me tired. Um, uh, any other any other comments about uh, about this? Um, so something. Uh, no, I, I started talking before I got, gave you a chance to ask questions. Yes? Would something like writing be a part of parole? Would that count? Or is that? Um, 
Well. Or is that only Right, writing, writing, speech, speech, and writing are are in, for this purpose almost identical. So they, they they're both here, they're both here, um, they're both are at the axis of Lang and Perl all the time at the axis of Lang and Perl. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, writing. So so later on when we get to deconstruction, this guy Jacques Derrida is going to say, oh, you know how we always give privilege to to writing? We should, I mean, to speech. Like we believe it's more true. We believe it's, uh, um, you know, I heard it from I heard it from the firsthand witness. Blah 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 blah. He's going to say, in fact, um, writing is the one that should be privileged rather than speech. And writing comes first, he says. He's a deconstructionist, so he always turns everything upside down. But he's very smart, really brilliant. But like that, he's going to say that. But I'm going to say, for our purposes, we're going to think about them almost identically. Like my speech is a form of writing. My writing is a form of speech. I believe, along with David Hartley, um, uh, the 18th century philosopher, that when you read, you hear the sounds in your brain. You like, If you know the language, you begin to hear the sounds in your brain. So it's almost like some little speaking auditor in your brain is reading to you as you read. So you're always in both systems. I would say they're kind of almost identical. They rely on one another. I mean, this is, this is in our language, in our life. I mean, there are... Um, non-textual languages or languages that have never been written down. Or even weirder, if you take Latin, they're going to tell you, um, oh, this is how you pronounce that. They don't really know how to say pronounce that. <laughs> we don't really know what a Latin speaker sounds like. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. This is so a dead language. <laughs> Yeah. This explanation might be a little bit long. Yeah. But I'm just trying to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand. No, no, I like this. So, like, this is a chair. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, like, go mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. context of this. Mm -hmm. So, this is a chair. Is essentially... The, the This is a chair. It's essentially language. Yes. And then the parole is me thinking about it and getting it across. No, no, no. The the statement, this is a chair, um, uh, happens here at the... At the... Um, at the... Uh, uh, crux. So, then... How is it a parole at first, essentially? It's not. It's 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 like they they don't. It's not at. There's no. There's no Beginning. distance. There's no distance between those two points. You, know, you have to imagine that you're always at the point of laying a parole. The statement, "This is a chair," in the instance you say it, is is speech. So it has this speech component, but it's never separated from language because it's always connected. To otherwise, if you said this is a chair, I would hear blah 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 blah. But we both share the language component. So when you say this is the chair, I can understand it. Yeah, Megan. So the book sort of explained it that it's like a piece of paper. So mm -hmm. like the front is parole, the back is yeah, like yeah, plan, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right. And so like, I guess the words itself, like just without thinking about it, I guess would be parole, but it, like on the same exact sheet is the meaning. Right. So, so another way to think about another way to think about this is to think that, um, and and this is the well, no, that's that's fine. I don't want to make it more complicated. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you I'm did. Like, that's good. Kind of it. Oh, it did. Good, good, good. Okay. So, but uh, going yeah. off of that, mm -hmm. then going to the the signified and the signified and the signs. So mm -hmm. the individual word is essentially signs, right? This whole thing is this whole thing. Uh, this whole thing is chair. So when you have the word. Then what you have here is um, a combination of the sound ch air and the image in your head of this thing. I did. I drew it badly, but that thing. I was trying to make it like. <laughs> never mind. It's a, it's gonna fall down. Don't sit in that chair, okay? It's just for guests. It's just for special guests that we want to fall down. Um, Yes, that's what you have in your head when you hear the word. But if I say what what committee did you get put on? And you said I got put on the library committee, and I said, Well, did they ask you to be chair? And you're like, if you don't know that L thing that, that you, you can have a chair of a committee, and that means basically the person who organizes the committee, mm -hmm. uh, then you'd be in big trouble because then you would be lost. 
Okay. All right, so um, we're gonna let me let me do one other one other thing, and then we'll uh, we're gonna talk about Jakobsen next time. Let me talk about um, uh, um, so th syntagmatic and paradigmatic, these are both other words that are sometimes used in structuralism and sometimes used by Cicero himself to talk about when you are um, dealing more or less uh, along one or the other of these axes. So when you are um, on the syntagmatic, you are on this level. And when you are on the paradigmatic, you are more on this level. So the axis, let me draw that, make sure I'm clear about what the axis is. Here's the axis. Um, now, one way to think about this is that um, uh, this has more to do with the individual utterance, and this has more to do with um, the larger system of speech that you're that you're dealing with, or larger system of language. Page forty-seven. Let me go ahead and read this. In a language state, everything is based on relations. I've already told you this, right? How do they function? Relations and differences between linguistic terms fall into two groups, each of which generates a certain class of values. The opposition between the two classes gives a better understanding of the nature of each class. They so in other words, you understand them better if you always understand that they're in opposition, syntagmatic and paradigmatic. The, uh, they correspond to two forms of our mental activity, both um, uh, indispensable to the life of language. In discourse, on the one hand, words acquire relations based on the linear nation, nature of language because they are chained together. Um, that's where you get the word. That's why syntagmatic sounds like syntax. It's like two things that are put together. Like in syntax, the sentence, the the rules that govern govern a sentence. Um, uh, this rules out the possibility of pronouncing two elements simultaneously. The elements are arranged in sequence on the chain of speaking. Combinations supported by linear linearity, right, running this way like a line. These are uh, uh, synt syntax synt syntax synt. How would you say that? Syntagm syntagms. I don't know. Synt synt syntagmatic. So it must be syntagm syntag. Somebody pronounce it for me. Syntagm syntagm. That's ridiculous. The syntagm is always composed of two or more consecutive units, e.g. in the French. So I guess you don't, I guess what I said about David Hartley before and sounding it out in your head, sometimes you don't do that. Syntagm. I think that's it, syntagm. The syntagm um, is always composed of two or more consecutive units, um, uh, e.g. French, relire, reread, con, uh, contre tout, against everyone in the humane, uh, right? So. So in the syntagmatic thing, it's always a relation of of one thing to the other, like this. So um, on the syntagmatic line, you get, uh, and this is the discursive line. Remember, so uh, that's what or what having to do with discourse. Um, uh, outside of discourse, on the other hand, words acquire relations of a different kind. Those have something in common, are associated in memory resulting in groups marked by diverse relations. Uh, uh, right. You know what, this is gonna come up in Jakobsen, 
So let me just say this. I've already said this when I said when I said when you have a memory, you're sort of in this paradigmatic line, and when you're just speaking and you're in the present, you're in the syntagmatic line. So discourse, which by the way is not just language. So discourse includes um, uh, uh, it, it includes language, it includes history, it includes um, uh, uh, societal rules and norms, all of that's considered discourse, not just language. And they all are based on um, anything that's in discourse is the only way to understand it is when it's in relation. So I would almost say that this is, remember we talked about um, really, really um, clear language that we call, I, I said Roland Bart would call it um, writer, writerly, like that sign that says fire extinguisher with an arrow down so you know where it is, right? Or um, the, uh, a line of poetry, like a slumber did my spirit seal, right? That one, that right there, is easy to understand and it's related to everything that you understand and falls mostly into the syntagmatic discursive level. Dream language or poetic language happens more in the paradigmatic uh, uh, level. That's when, um, when you're sort of like, ha like he, the, the, the example that Sassur gives is um, you think of the word teacher and that makes you think of, okay, what do you think about if I say the word teacher? Somebody who educates another person. All right. Uh, call into mind an image of a teacher. Me. Okay. To call into mind an, uh, an earlier teacher. Okay. Okay. Who is it? His name is Mr. Bumble. Okay. Okay. Um, call into mind a teacher. Or what, what comes to mind if I say the word teacher? It's just someone who assists me in understanding anything. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, what what happens if I if I uh, if I ask you to just uh, call into mind the image of a teacher? What does it look like? Basically, what I'm trying to get at is that when you say the word teacher, I'm so, I'm suddenly thinking of a line from Wordsworth, uh, or no, from um, from Coleridge, where he says. Um, uh, the great universal teacher shall mold and make the ask, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about God suddenly. And then like, I'm like, oh no, I'm thinking about this rapper, calls himself the teacher, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm, I, suddenly my mind is going all different places. I'm, I'm not connected one thing to another. Language has this like opening up paradigmatic kind of quality when you're just thinking. When I'm, when I'm walking, you see me walking across campus, do not believe I'm in the syntagmatic area. I'm completely in the paradigmatic thing. I'm like, you know, I wonder if my son is gonna do this, I wonder if that's, oh, that's pretty. These are stupid statues. Oh my God, I wonder when I'm gonna do this. I really need to eat something, but God, it's hard to be a vegan on this campus. You know, like, it's like, I'm thinking all these things, and it's like, and sometimes I'll just be like, they won't even be connected in whole sentences. It'll just be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's kind of whatever. Or music will be coming, coming into my, all mixing together. This morning, Dexter Gordon, or World Saxophone Quartet, both of which I listened to in the way here, entering into my mind. So that's the paradigmatic. These are both, um, what does he call them? He calls them both relations, syntagmatic and associative relations. So let me ask you a question really quickly. <coughs> Saussure says, language is a form, not a substance. Language is a form, not a substance. What do you think he means by that? How can we, um, based on everything we've learned today, and I think we've learned a lot about Saussure, language, form, not substance. What does he mean? Give me some different meanings. I'm not looking for one, I'm looking for many. So anything you say will be good. Yes, Kate. When I think of like a substance, I think of something that's like definite. And mm. I think language can be like always varying and you can't always like pin down a meaning or a reasoning behind it. 
Okay, good, 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 good. Good. So substance is more is more kind of um, is more fixed, more static, more stable, and language is more fluid and moving and changing all the time. What else does he what do you, what do you mean by form, not substance? I'll add one of my own, okay? Language then becomes a container. Like like uh, like a mold, you pour the you pour the substance into the mold. Language is the mold, right? That's another thing. It's too it's just on its own. It's too 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 simplistic. I think language is not quite a mold, but it can be a container. Language as container for substance. And you need that sometimes. You you gotta go. I won't yell at them. I did because people get upset. Try to go fire. You know, like then suddenly. Uh, there'd be a lot of substance put into my form. What, are, what else do you think he means by it's a form, not a substance? Or what else can you take into me? Can it mean for us? Right. It can change. Um, form is what it's holding. If anything inside of it can, can change. So words and meaning can be interchanged. Yes. Yes. So so um, um, <coughs> you're describing language as like <coughs> like Legos. It can be kind of moved around and kind of has this whatever. Legos are a form, not a substance or something like that. But they're like invisible Legos. Or their <coughs> intangible label, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the Legos can be changed around, but it's still a Lego. So it holds the form. Yes. But it can be changed around. Like all of Legos can be changed around. But right. It's still just one. Right. Language is just the form. It stays the same. Right. But it can be moved. Around. Right. The worst thing that happened to Lego. Is when they started making little actual like things that were something. Do you know what I mean? When they weren't just blocks or whatever. Because then it kills the imagination. Right? Oh no, that's Darth Vader. That cost me so much money. Don't <laughs> this whole thing, you know. <laughs> Don't, you know, I got lost it, you know. It's like, no, make another one. Make some you know what I'm saying? That it, that 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 they stopped being a form and they started becoming a substance. And that's the other thing is we think about Substance is being substantive, eternal, whatever, as opposed to kind of playful and and possible, filled, filled with possibilities. These are good answers. I don't really know. I mean, I was I came across that sentence last night when I was reading, and I was like, hmm, that would be a good one to ask. All right. So for Thursday, please bring your um, commonplace books um, uh, uh, with a couple paragraphs on each reading, or one paragraph on each reading. Um, uh, uh, we read the, the Jakobsen, or if you haven't read the Sisor, please read the Sisor. And then, um, uh, yeah, I will get back to you on your on your things. And I, I know who's here, so I'll go ahead and mark the attendance. I didn't send a sign-up sheet around. And Kate, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Emma, if you can talk to me um, just while I pack up. Thanks, everybody. Have a good... Uh